All right, no jumper, coolest podcast in the world here at uh, our new location, very high security, to interview the one and only <laughs> DJ Vlad. What's up, Adam? How you doing, man? I'm good. Yeah. I'm good, man. Kind of a sad day in LA right now. This is a very good point. The Nipsey's uh, funeral, man. You can just feel it, especially being in LA. You just just feel the the weight of it all, man. So, mm. Yeah, you, know. you you remember when you first became familiar with him because you interviewed him what five six years ago or. Yeah, yeah, man. I remember when he first, you know, when he first came out. I think he was actually signed uh, to a major label, it may have been Epic. I'm not totally oh, okay. sure. Um, but yeah, we had been hearing about him, and then, um, you know, I, I think one of my people did a, a short interview with him. Mm -hmm. Like this was right. like nine years ago, where we asked like the top five girls, oh, okay. you know, and, and he mentioned Lauren London. Wow, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like he actually like spoke it into existence uh, years later. And then me and him got to actually sit down in New York, and we did like about a, I don't know, maybe like a forty-minute interview okay. or so that we actually were putting out today, like the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, cool dude, man. Ran into him a few times. Uh, only good things to say, quite honestly. Yeah, he's a, he's a weird one to see past because that's pretty much the consensus is that yeah. nobody has anything negative to contribute about him. It's like we're seeing a reaction to his passing that a lot of people are saying they haven't seen it since Tupac. Yeah, man. I mean, you saw the big reaction from XXX and Tassion, but mm. I can honestly say this is a bigger, just a bigger outcry. For LA, for sure. Yeah. yeah absolutely. No, pretty crazy. So, okay. A lot of people, I feel like they have no idea where Vlad is coming from. So I feel like we, we owe it to them, at least to reiterate the story of where Vlad came from and how Vlad became who he is today because I, I mean let's just start off I guess before we even say that I'm just a massive fan of the content I'm a massive fan of the machine that you guys seem to have in place that's like it, part of what I've been trying to figure out as just a fan is like how the fuck does this guy produce this much content and how does he how has he been doing it for so goddamn long too so what do you want to know okay well let, let's just no, let, let's go back let's go back yeah. so you were born uh, in the Ukraine in the Ukraine. It used to be part of the USSR, mm -hmm. part of the Soviet Union at that time, so I consider myself Russian. Mm -hmm. but technically, it's not Russia anymore, but right. I was born into Russia. Okay. And I moved to the U.S. when I was about four years old. And you moved where? First, I moved to Massachusetts, and then we stayed there for a few years. Where? Uh, Springfield. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Western Mass. Yeah. Uh, I lived in Springfield. And then my parents moved to uh, you know to the West Coast, mm -hmm. first to San Francisco for you know maybe about a year. And then uh, I, I grew up in San Mateo. Okay. Kind of a suburb of San Francisco. Uh huh. Uh, went to school at UC Berkeley and kind of stayed in Berkeley and Oakland for a bunch of years. And you were always a hip hop fan this whole time? Always a hip hop fan, like from elementary school. Uh huh. You know, when hip hop sort of kind of became national outside of New York, the mm -hmm. New York City Breakers became sort of a thing on television. I kind of became a break dancer during that time and I started buying like the early, like Grandmaster Flash, the Furious Five albums, the first Run DMC album. You know, and really there was very little hip hop, period. So I would just go to the record store and buy, you know, a, a vinyl just, you know, without even hearing it first mm -hmm. and go home and hope it was, <laughs> it you was dope. You through the thanks and like the line. Yeah, the yeah, see who produced other. it and you know. yeah, man, you can really, you know, went to like warehouse records. You couldn't really listen to this shit ahead of time. So right. you just bought and hope for the best. What, what do you feel like drew you to that world? Um, I think being a, a Russian kid named Vlad, mm right at the height of the cold war with wow. russia yeah. where i was like basically the devil to everybody so you, you know were getting I mean? jokes in school like the way a muslim kid might in 2001 yeah yeah i mean imagine you know right after 9 11 there's a kid named osama mm. you know in the school with no other muslim kids and everyone's looking at him like he's the enemy like a lot of you know a lot of fights a lot of teasing, you know, a lot of arguing, just a lot of uncomfortableness because there was no other, where I was living, there wasn't a Russian community. It was really right. just me and that's it. Uh, so sort of like the, you know, hip hop was kind of like really like an outcast kind of culture during that time. And it, I just kind of got drawn to it, you know, between the music and the break dancing. Um, it just became my thing and it just became a lifelong thing after that. Do you have any like recollections of your early encounters with different media outlets or anything like that? Were you somebody who was like particularly yeah. drawn to the source? Because myself, I noticed yeah. per really drawn from like young age to any kind of media. I, I read every issue of the source. I read every issue of Double XL when it first came out. Um, I was reading rap pages. I was reading like... You know, in the Bay Area, we had a bunch of independent mags like Industry Rule, 4080, um, just whatever I can get my hands on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and kind of looking at it now, like I never thought that I would have, 
a media outlet that's bigger than some of those you know magazines that i used to read so it was and just you're kind assisted of by the fact that some of them have not uh, fared so well not not so well <laughs> not so well yeah the source is kind of just scraping along i mean double xl has their um uh you know their freshman mm -hmm. issue but that's kind of their their one claim to fame right uh, you know overall numbers wise it, it is what it is and you know it's the weird thing to see is that if you ask me double xl and the source and stuff they sort of forfeited a lot of their influence to the blogs during the blog era and then the blogs sort of disappeared over time and ushered in a new era so yeah. it's kind of like the 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 the, the institutions that killed off the hip-hop bible and such like they're not really around to witness the, the the end result yeah i mean i actually met with the source and double xl and offered to work with them and they really kind of just snubbed their nose at me and were like now we got this you know we don't need your help really so i'm like all right yeah i mean at one point i was gonna buy double xl <laughs> i was what, actually what talking year? to the publisher uh this was like it was before they got bought out like maybe about five years ago five six years ago really yeah i was thinking about it like i said i was, I was talking to dennis page who was the publisher of harris uh harris publishing uh -huh. their parent company right i mean him had a, a couple talks about it but what he was offering kind of didn't really make a lot of sense and what, what would you really have to gain from that besides you know a brand name um i, I think you know well number one you, you have the the catalog right that comes That's with true. it and i think that what we do is kind of a little bit different than what double xl does mm -hmm. they're more focused on the music side so it would, would have been cool to kind of have yeah kind of a pure music kind of play like that as somebody who's like primarily a youtube channel there is always that that guy that uh sort of urge of like fuck like it would be kind of cool to just really hone in on the website thing although you you have the website but i feel it feels yeah. like the youtube channel is like by far the focus at this point yeah yeah i mean uh i think like last year that's when the youtube revenue started to really surpass the website revenue but i mean the website revenue is still strong it you is. know the app is still strong but but youtube at this point has kind of gone through the roof mm -hmm. so what about like the the time period between you being like a young early hip-hop fan up until you start to get into the the media game what was like what did you concern yourself with during those times i mean i kind of started I mean, I started producing, you know, like, I mean, from going from just being a fan and a break dancer and, you know, just someone who just loved listening to hip hop. Uh, when I got to college at UC Berkeley, I started, um, you know, there was kind of a hip hop community there, mm -hmm. which is where, which really, there wasn't one where I was growing up. You right. know, this was like, you got to see hieroglyphics and souls of mischief kind of blow up, you know, right in front of us, mm -hmm. you know, hanging out in Berkeley. So I started making beats and I started producing um and that kind of did that for a couple of years but wasn't all that great in it then i started djing and then that's when uh things started to kind of take off and i moved to new york uh in 2002 as a mixtape dj okay and that's when things started to ramp up i started coming out these um there's these mixtapes called rap phenomenon there was a, a biggie one and a tupac one that won like every mixtape award and you were the one actually doing all the scratching or cuts that, or whatever so it might have been. Not the scratching, but more like the blending. Right. Like the taking the, you know, because from being a producer, it's like going from like, okay, taking these vocals and putting on this beat, then maybe getting like Bun B to come do a verse. And, and in keys. retrospect, it seems crazy because it's like, wow, I was getting away with a shitload of copyright infringement. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and I remember, I remember the day that I said, you know, I'm not going to fuck with this mixtape shit anymore because I was, I had a business selling these mixtapes to little mom and pop stores and then DJ Drama got bu uh, mm -hmm. got busted. They raided his house, his and he like, was the studio. He was one of the biggest ones at the time. And um, they, I remember they towed his car right. <laughs> and they, they seized his bank accounts and I'm like, this shit ain't worth it. They weren't making an example out of him basically to tell people like you, like, you better fucking stop too, yeah. right? And, you know, it was a hustle. It wasn't a mm -hmm. career. It was like, you know... I wasn't going to keep elevating making these semi-illegal, illegal compilations. And it wasn't turning into record deals. I mm. wasn't becoming DJ Khaled. I was getting booked for shows and I was doing shows in Australia and Japan and Europe. And that was cool. But it wasn't like I was starting to get older and I'm like, all right, this is, this has a shelf life. How much was the most mixtapes you were selling in a month at, at the height? Maybe a few thousand. Okay. A few thousand. I was paying my mortgage and, you know, I had like a condo in Jersey and, you know, I had a little BMW X3, you know, right. nothing, not balling, but, you know, living, living okay. Right. You know. But were you looking at the hip hop media as if it was an opportunity? You know, I was doing the mixtapes and I saw that that was about to 
you know, kind of go away because the mom and pop stores were going away. Mm -hmm. So then I started doing DVDs, like street DVDs, and that was kind of cool. And that was kind of starting to go away as well because DVDs yeah. were going away. And that, that was gone yeah. by 2007, 2008 yeah. was when it started to really fall yeah, off? Yeah, 2008. And that was kind of, and I, was, I started doing documentaries. Mm -hmm. I did uh, this documentary called Ghost Ride the Whip, mm -hmm. which was, you know, was picked up. It was on MTV and I think Netflix picked it up and that didn't really make any money, mm -hmm. even though it was a cool project. And then YouTube came around in 2008 with the, with the partner program, you know, and, uh, I just saw the vision. I said, this is the next shit, like right off the bat. I said, this right here is going to be the biggest video platform on earth. So you knew, that's pretty I impressive. Knew. I knew, well, cause you know, when I went to Berkeley, I was a computer science major. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was a tech guy already. I was a computer programmer for a couple of years before mm -hmm. I, I kind of moved into the music thing. So you, that, that's interesting. That, that's yeah. kind of how you landed on it so early is you already had that like computer knowledge and then you also had the hip hop knowledge and yeah. you were able to and bring I'm it at, all together. I'm in Berkeley, you know? which is kind of Silicon Valley, like the dot com thing was happening. Like I was, I saw the, the, you know, technically I saw the vision of it. Right. You know, like, okay, you could make this video and other websites could put it on. Like, oh, so I don't need a big website to make this video big. So it, it kind of, you know, like the light bulb went off 